Peace to the gods, Yusuf L here. I got, I'm got. i gonna do a video review. Somebody sent me a TikTok video in my Secure Party Predator Facebook group. And it's an individual that is, you know, just going in on other individuals who teach other di different things. Let me, let me say this real quick. I've been doing this for 20 years. I've seen gurus come and go. I've seen guys pop out of everywhere with different processes. And the first thing they do is denigrate other people's processes to pump up their process. I teach secure party. It's not called secure party creditor, by the way. It's called secured party slash creditor. A secured party is the creditor because there's a creditor and debtor relationship. And I'm going to get in and explain that. And one of the things that I often hear when I hear the people who are denigrating other processes, I listen to them closely and inevitably it's always that they really don't know what they're talking about because they haven't studied the other process. It's something akin to an individual um, talking badly about Christianity, but he's never read the Bible or talking badly about Islam, but he's never read the Quran, but he's never lived, uh, lived as a Muslim, studied Islam, did salats or anything like that. But he's going to tell you about the religion. That's what you have in this space operating too. But today I'm going to take the time to look at this video and see what this individual has to say about different processes and tell you whether or not he's on point. I'm going to be fair I'm not going in because I'm not like they are. You know, they just they just kind of like hate shit <laughs> and everything. But I'm going to look at it. If they say something correct, I'm going to say it. And if it's not, I'm going to tell you why it's not. And then I'm going to uh, show you why. Okay, let's get into it. All right, let's finally squash all of this misinformation that keeps spreading like wildfire from all these pirates that are tricking all these people into paying for these programs, giving false information. All right, the first main thing I want to talk about is no contracts are valid. All right, yes, David Windmiller can prove in a court of law that grammatically there are no treaties or contracts that are structured properly, but that's not how the legal system operates. It does not matter what is truthful, right, or just. It only matters about what you can prove. So he could go into a courtroom if he was a and now, what he said right there is absolutely true. In court, it's not about right or wrong. I have an attorney friend. He explained that to me. He said, come on, Joe. He said, he said, in court, it's not about right or wrong. It's about what you can prove. And he said, we test you on two things, your resolve and your resources. So he is right on that point. It's about evidence and what you can substantiate uh, from anything that you're doing. So he's right on that point prove that there's no structured contracts properly. And furthermore, a lot of people think that because Federal Reserve notes were exchanged on a contract that there is no value. That is false because that is backed by a some. Okay, what's interesting right here, I've never heard that. I've never heard people say that because a Federal Reserve note is exchanged on a contract, there isn't any value. I, I don't, I, I've never heard that. In this space, let me educate you. Okay, it's about money of account and money of exchange. Gold and silver is the only thing that can satisfy a debt obligation. When you're using Federal Reserve notes, what you're really do, using is debt to offset other debt. Okay, it's debt paper that's being exchanged. The issue that people are having with the contracts is that there has to be uh, offer acceptance and consideration. Now, me, myself, I don't get into those discussions about whether or not a contract is fraudulent or not, because fraud is one of the hardest things to prove because you have to prove intent. What I get into is the portion of the contract that says, how do you satisfy it? And, and you can't find a contract on earth that says you have to use Federal Reserve notes to satisfy an obligation. OK, that is what the issue is that we that we are using over here. I don't know what you're using over there, but we're not arguing about value or anything like that. We're arguing about satisfying the obligation and what your what type of instrument you're going to use. Now, if you want to argue about whether or not Federal Reserve notes have any value, you can easily go to page two of Modern Money Mechanics issued by the Federal Reserve of Chicago, Illinois. And it tells you very clearly that Federal Reserve notes have no intrinsic value, that the only value they have is because somebody else will accept them. They're negotiability. They're worthless pieces of paper. They are. Let's continue. Someone's promised to pay one day. It has full faith and credit. There is slight value to it. A lot of people want to claim that contracts are fraud when they start to get in default on some type of payments, but that's not how contracts work. Yes, our signatures created the asset on the books of the banks that they monetized, but when you started paying on that, you consummated that contract. When you took that promotional item home, you consummated that. Yeah, like once again, I don't know where he's getting this from. I've been doing this 20 years, and, uh, you know, the people I'm around, we're not... Fraud, a lot of people do bring up fraud, and fraud is one of the hardest things in law to prove because you got to prove intent. What we have is you have the Banker's Secret Manual, 
And this guy is a CPA. And I actually have a video on YouTube where these CPAs explain to you how the transaction actually comes about. There isn't any real exchange that's going on. And that it is fraudulent. It is fraudulent, but it'd be difficult to prove. The only way you, uh, you could prove it is you'd have to have a CPA that audits a bank. That's not the route that you want to take. Now, under Tom Shaw's book, The Banker's Secret Manual, he has breach of contract and where you ask them questions. Now, you have the, uh, as a case in Minnesota, this case is the Credit River uh, decision with Jerome Daly, and I'm posting it right here. You go and read this case. This was the last time that a banker actually came into the bank and testified, and it's actually a lawyer that instituted this case, all right? And he testified on stand that they don't loan anything on a, a transaction for a mortgage. And the, the judge ended up dead. He was found dead six months later, drowned in a lake. And, they, and when, he, when they uh, killed the judge, then they rescinded the case or, you know, they overruled the case. After he couldn't, uh, the, you know, the judge couldn't testify or anything like that. Now, it would be very, very interesting for everybody to go and read that case. So because this obviously this guy right here has not. It's called the Credit River Decision. Go and research that case. And you also need to go and study the affidavit of Walker Todd. Walker Todd was an attorney. He worked for the Federal Reserve, an expert witness. And in his document, he's, uh, he testifies that the banks don't loan any money. There's no exchange of anything of value on uh, in money. So that's an attorney who works for the Federal Reserve telling you this. As well as what I said, once again, you can get modern money mechanics issued by the Federal Reserve of Chicago on page two. And it tells you that Federal Reserve notes are worthless pieces of paper. They have no intrinsic value. Their only value is because somebody else will accept them. Is what it is. Another thing I get all the time is find your indentured trustee at a bank. You, you do not have an indentured trustee at a bank unless you have appointed one and they have accepted it. You can try to appoint one, but if they don't accept it, you do not have a trustee at a bank. In order to get a trustee at a bank, you've got to spend massive amounts of money because it is not cheap to get a trustee from a bank. Secure I have no idea what he's talking about getting a trustee as a, at a bank. It is true. In a relationship of a trust, you have a settler. It's called a settler, grantor, creator, trustor. Those are the names of the people who create the trust. And, of course, you have a trustee. And then you have the uh, trust corpus or the rays of the trust. You may have a trust protector depending on the size of the trust. And, of course, you have the beneficiaries so, or what is called also the uh, sestike trust. That's another name for beneficiary in case you want, you're unaware. Um, I'm not sure what he means. Uh, a trustee does have to accept the appointment of, of, a, of a trustee, but you have implied trust too. You have something called constructive trust and trustee ex malficio. Um, you have resultant trust. Uh, you have all different types of trust. I'm not really sure. I can't really comment on this because he seems to be talking about a trustee as a bank. He's correct. And usually for someone at a bank to accept a position as a trustee of a trust, yes, that trust has to have some capital. It has to be capitalized. It has to be worth whatever it is that they're, and you got to pay because you got to pay a trustee. But I don't know about, um, I don't understand what, what he's talking about, a trustee at a bank. I have no idea of what he's, what he's talking about with that right there. Trust relationships uh, are created through contract. So a trustee can get uh, receive some sort of remuneration for his services in a variety of different ways. Uh, you know, you can have a trust capital units, all different kinds of things that you can use to serve to pay for a trustee. So I'm not really sure exactly what he's talking about. He seems like he has a limited uh, knowledge of trust, which a lot of people do. And they're always commenting on it. That's all I can say on that right there. Secured party creditor. Oh my goodness. I deal with this all day long. So the secured party creditor process is such a garbage process. The U.S. citizen is not your property. That is the state's property. And by you putting a lien on that, you're harming the credit of an entity that is not even yours and you don't even have to use. And when you do a UCC1, that is an international financial statement that is making a claim, you better have an agreement between all parties on that contract or you are committing international crimes. You want to you are so full of shit saying this. You can't prove shit you saying. You talking about you you have you have international UCC, sir. UCC is international law, but not all UCC ones are international. I hope you understand that first and foremost. So let me clarify something for you because you just re I've heard this in 20 years. You're saying exactly the same thing that I heard a lot of other people say who know nothing about the secure party process. So I know you don't know anything about it because you're just regurgitating what you heard. So let me enlighten you. First of all, 
You're not putting a lien on a straw man. You're putting a lien against your labor. The straw man is considered a transmitting utility or a bridge between the public and the private. Now, I would suggest that you read something like, what does acceptance for value mean? So you can understand value and how value comes from the private into the public by way of the signature and exactly what exchange is going on, what the public is receiving in value for our signature, for our utilization of our private credit in the public, and what we are receiving in the private is value by allowing them to use our credit. There's an exchange going on. So I would suggest that you read that book, but nobody is putting a lien against the straw man. You don't own the straw man. It is the creator of the United States. You're putting a lien against your labor. The straw man couldn't exist or have any existence without your labor and you putting a claim on your labor and everything that is a result of your labor, which is what the United States does because the full faith and credit of the United States comes from the people who are the taxpayers who go out and work and make labor. And but so the 13th Amendment is against involuntary servitude because I let me ask you a question. How are they collateralizing U.S. citizens and borrowing money and using them as security? What kind of contract is in effect? Who's surety for these Federal Reserve notes? It comes through the Social Security number, obviously. Okay, so I'll, you got it wrong, like many of you do, because you haven't read it and you haven't studied it. It takes about three years to become functionally literate in this space. So I would suggest that you reserve your comments because you don't know what you're talking about. People have been filing UCC-1s for 30 years and no one has went to jail for filing a UCC-1 not one time. Now you can go to Kentucky, I'm just giving y'all one, y'all can go and look and see for yourself. You can go to the Kentucky website and uh, get their UCC because they're free. It's one of the most easily accessible uh, UCC commercial chambers to view, and it is considered an international gateway. And you can go in there and you can look at the plethora of people who've been filing UCC ones and not one person has went to jail. You do have to have a security agreement, of course, because you have a creditor and debtor relationship, but that's a private agreement and you don't file that with a UCC one, like a lot of ignorant people do. I, that's why you put your address information on there because there's collateral that's being encumbered. And if any prospective creditor has a question about what you have done, they are to contact you and you can explain to them what is going on. It's a private process and it's based off of contract law. But usually individuals like this, they don't know what they're talking about. He comes in talking about such a garbage process. People, they trying to attack something. I can stand on everything that I'm doing because I've been doing it for 20 years and have success with it. So what you're talking about doesn't mean anything. And here's the next thing. Why do y'all post people like this in my Facebook group? Where, where is he some sort of authority or something? Who is this guy? <laughs> what? <laughs> just, I heard this so many times. I, I, I just don't understand it commit commercial suicide, go ahead and put a UCC one lien on a straw man. And then I think the funniest kicker about the whole process is we are actually the trustees in charge of all the duties, debts and liabilities and obligations of the US citizen. So when you put a lien on it, guess who's obligated to set that off and pay for it? You are. Wow. If you actually took the time to read a bond in the secure party process, that's exactly what it says. But you are simultaneously a trustee and a beneficiary. You do understand that in trust law, you can be a trustee and a beneficiary. You just cannot be the sole trustee and the sole beneficiary. That's called trust merger doctrine. You are simultaneously a beneficiary and a trustee. However, however, if you would read the paperwork, that is the agreement that you're making with the Federal Reserve. I mean, with the Treasury Department. That's the agreement you're making with the Treasury Department, that you're going to set off all debt. Anything that you offer to them, that's why they call it acceptance for value. And that's why you don't argue anything. There are four rules to the game. There's a public and a private, and they never mix. Should be common sense. There isn't any money, meaning there's no constitutional gold or silver that is in circulation. We only have Federal Reserve notes uh, that are operating within the democracy, which is the territorial jurisdiction of the United States. You have to stay in honor at all costs, meaning you have to honor all of your obligations, and that you do not participate in public controversy. You don't argue anything. Perhaps if you would take the time to actually look into some of these processes before you make videos like that, you won't look foolish and make foolish videos like this.
All right, common law is the highest form of law. All right, look, a lot of us get woken up to this matrix and the rabbit trails of how we're actually sovereign and above all kinds of things through common law. Common law is very high on the land, but it is not the highest form of law. Equity is, chancellery is, chancellor. Look into equity as the highest form of law, and it trumps everything because it is the spirit of the law. I don't know what the hell he's talking about right here. He doesn't even know what common law is. Okay, there are four jurisdictions in the United States. There's common law, equity, maritime, admiralty. These are in the Constitution for the United States. Common law is unwritten law. It's a body of principles and customs that don't come into realization until some facts have been entered into a case. Another name for common law is stare decisis or case law. Or another name for common law is judge-made law. You can look all this up and see what I'm saying. But individuals, they don't know what common law is. Common law is alive and well. You have something called federal common law, which is the case law of the federal, uh, of the federal judiciary. He does not, most people don't understand uh, what common law is. I think Justice Story gave the best definition of common law, and I'll post it right here where you can see it. I have it on my website. As far as equity being the highest form of law, equity was a result because the common law was so strict. OK, so equity was a, a remedy that the king started to use in lieu of common law because of the strictness of the common law. So I'm not really I don't understand what he's saying. It's the highest form of law. God judges in equity is in the Bible. And that is what private citizens use. And the only reason that private citizens use equity is because contract law is private law. And that's what all, all interaction between private citizens is contractual in nature. And that is where our remedy is. Our remedy is in equity. So he is right about that. But I don't understand what he's talking about, highest form of law. You know, the common law and admiralty uh, courts have been battling each other for centuries. You can read the clerk's praxis and read the historical uh, context on that and uh, a historical section on that and find out for yourself. Once again, I don't think this individual uh, really understands what he's talking about at all. All right, last but not least, being a belligerent in order to get rights. Yes, out in the public, you have to state claims and rights, but being a belligerent is completely against everything that I have studied over the last 10 years. You have to be at peace and in harmony. If you are an enemy or a belligerent, you are considered a combatant and you do not have any rights or remedies. The Constitution is suspended to enemies. Contracts aren't even valid between two enemies inside of a court case. So you have to always be at peace and come from love. Okay, right there, I don't know what the hell he was talking about right there. There's something called the belligerent claimant, okay? Now, it depends on what time, when, it, when it's going to time for you to be belligerent. Sometimes in court, you have to be belligerent in order to get your rights. Let me read the case law for you so you can see what is being said right here about the belligerent claimant because he said he's been doing this 10 years, which is an okay amount of time. You learn a little bit in 10 years. I've been doing it 20 years and I've been, and I've actually gone in court and done all the things that I've said. I don't even know if this guy has even been in court. When, one thing when you're dealing with individuals, you have to ask them, have you done anything you said? And the next thing you want to see is, well, what did you learn in 10 years and what is exactly is the thing that you're teaching? You didn't see that because he's not going to subject that to scrutiny. I'm just saying. Here's the belligerent claimant right here. The belligerent claimant. The privilege against self-incrimination is neither accorded to the passive resistant nor the person who is ignorant of his rights, nor to one indifferent thereto. It is a fighting clause. His benefits can be retained only by sustained combat. It cannot be retained by attorney or solicitor. It is valid only when insisted upon by a belligerent claimant in person. The one who is persuaded by hundred words or moral suasion to testify or produce documents rather than make a last-ditch stand simply loses the protection. Once he testifies to part, he has waived his right and must on cross-examination or otherwise testify as to the whole transaction. He must refuse to answer or produce and test the matter in competent proceedings or by habeas corpus. District Judge James Alger Fee, United States versus Johnson.